the second derivative test. I mean, up till now, the second derivative was this nightmarish thing that you had to do in some questions. You took the derivative and you had to take the derivative again. So now in this lesson, we finally find out the awesome application of the second derivative. Oh, sorry, one awesome application of the second derivative. And there's some pictures underneath, which I'm going to, <laughs> I'm actually on this page going to redraw those pictures essentially and draw those same things, but you get to see it live this time, okay? So don't feel the need to scramble to copy what I'm gonna write down because it's really all underneath everything I'm gonna say here. But my, live, it's, it's a little better if I draw it as we go. We have seen the first derivative test can be used to determine that where uh, there are a local max or min occurs. What's the first derivative test? Yeah, something like that. That's the first derivative test. We build a chart and we go, we're going from going up to going down, something like that. We can also use the second derivative test to find out the exact same information. It can be much faster than this. It can be much easier than this. I, I warned that this lesson really goes hand in hand with the other lesson because at the end of doing all the work in the previous word problems, you're like, oh, I still got to build the chart. You know, I'm giving you another option here, a second choice here. Really, a second, the second derivative, it's a second choice. Well, first we have to understand what the second derivative tells us about a function. So there's two possibilities. The second derivative can be greater than zero, like positive, yeah? Or the second derivative can be less than zero, like negative, okay? And this is a really tough concept until you get it and then all of a sudden there'll be this click and you go, oh, I get that. I totally understand what's happening here. I'm gonna do it with my arm first and then I'm gonna draw the picture. If the double derivative is greater than zero, it means that the derivative is getting bigger. That's the first big implication. F prime getting larger. Now we need to be careful. I don't like writing that because that's not very precise actually what getting larger means. So what I'm gonna to add to that is it's getting more and more positive. So a negative derivative, take a look at my arm. This is, this is the whole lesson right here. If you, if you, if you get what I do on the screen here, it's, it's the whole deal. If you start with a negative derivative, but the double derivative is positive, it means the derivative is getting more and more positive. More and more and more and more positive. The double derivative is the curvature. That's the word you'll use way later in university. It's how is this thing curving, okay? So take a look. If I start off with a slope that was, say, negative, the next slope will be less negative because the double derivative is greater than zero. We're getting, the derivative is getting more, bigger and bigger. The derivative is getting larger. You're getting these derivatives and you get, and you start curving upwards because the double derivative is positive. The derivatives are getting larger and larger. You go the other way, if the derivative is less, th double derivative is less than zero, it means derivatives are getting more and more negative. Not more and more negative. If they're positive, oh, I wanna go with a curve here this time. If the, if the derivative is already positive, stop it. If the derivative is already positive, it's jumping all over the place in here. If the derivative is already positive, what's going to happen if the double derivative is negative is it's going to get less positive, less positive, less positive, until it gets to zero. Double derivative being negative, it's going to get more and more and more negative. You physics people, this is acceleration. Tells you where you're going to go next. What's the derivative going to do next? The derivative is going to be, if it's starting off in the, in the double derivative positive section, the derivative, is, what's it going to do next? It's going to get more positive. And here it's going to get more negative. Grand conclusion. If the double derivative is positive, in that area we're talking about a minimum. If the double derivative is negative, in that area, we're talking about a maximum. Actually, your parabola stuff will help here. Negative leading coefficient, maximum. Positive leading coefficient, minimum. It's not a perfect analogy, by the way. It just ties in with something you already know. Let me re-explain it again with these pictures here. If the double derivative is positive, this thing is going to curve upwards. If the double derivative is negative, this thing's going to curve downwards. If it's curving upwards, you have a minimum. If it's curving downwards, you have a maximum. Said formally up here. If the double derivative is positive, you've got a max. If the double derivative is negative, you've got a min. 
sorry, if the double derivative is positive, you got a min. If the double derivative is negative, you got a max. If the double derivative is zero, the test fails. You have to use the first derivative test. So it's possible that this won't work. It's, it's possible this won't work. And so that's what I said down here. Hopefully you're thinking, why didn't you show us this first? This sounds a lot faster than this than the single derivative test, building the chart and subbing in values and everything like that. And it is, it's beautiful. But notice the part that the test can fail. You might be you might have to fall back on the first derivative test. Not very often. You can go with double derivative the whole time. Yeah? Upcoming assignment, you're like, oh yeah, I gotta prove it's a maximum or a minimum. You don't have to go back to this if you don't want to. You got this. You want to see it in action? Well, here I go. Three examples, basically, where I'm going to show you it in action. So if you're trying to gather your strength for the last three examples, as I am, we're doing one with just a nice little function here. Then we're doing one with a easy word problem. And then one with uh, one that's got a little more torque to it. I sat there earlier and pre-drew the diagram for us to get it all ready, so you don't have to watch me struggle with it. Yeah, OK. So. Okay, so this problem we could have done a few hours ago. Yeah? It says find the local max and min. So we go, okay, four max min. Set f prime to zero. As promised, I think I've said that again and again. It seems like every single problem we have the same plan. Take the derivative, set it to zero. So my derivative this time, f prime at x, pretty simple derivative here. 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. Set it equal to zero. Little factoring here. I'm going to check all this because my brain feels a little foggy. So I better check to make sure I did it all right here. Yeah, I feel good about it. Yeah? And just to be clear to use these words again, therefore critical numbers. are x equals negative 1 and 3. You're unimpressed. You're like, oh, I can't believe I stayed awake for this. That's all the same stuff. Hey, how are you? Good. I'm going to do a quick lesson. I do have a, do you want to come back in 15, uh, 20? And then I'll go for 15, 20 and then come back or something like that. Yeah. Best of luck. That's what I'm going to do too. Later. Yeah, that's good. Have fun. No panic if you're if you're running a little late. It's no worries. Okay, you're unimpressed. You should be unimpressed. You're like, yeah, no big deal. Then what we would do next, because if we want to categorize these max mins, is using the first derivative test, we'd build the chart x less than negative one between negative one and three between greater than three. Not this time. This time we we'll use the second derivative test. Here comes second derivative test. We find the second derivative, f double prime at x equals 6x six minus 6. Pretty easy. And I, I sort of nudged this a, a couple of, I don't know, I don't know how long ago it was ago. I can't even keep track. A bunch of lessons ago, I nudged at the idea that the double derivative often is easier than the single derivative. The degrees have all come down. It doesn't have to happen, but lots of times taking the double derivative is pretty straightforward compared to the single derivative. Not always. Now watch this. Okay. f double prime. at negative 1 equals uh, negative 6, uh, negative 12. f double prime at 3 equals 18 minus 6 is 12. I've just subbed in the number there. And at this point in the lesson, you're like, I, I don't know what you're up to here. But here, it all comes down right now. I now can make a conclusion using the second derivative test and the information I have. Therefore, Negative 1 comma, oh, we got to talk about negative 1 comma what? I don't know what it is. Is a, you think about it for a second, I know whether it's a max or a min. I don't need the table. This number told me. Well, the number didn't tell me, but something about it told me. Yeah, yeah, frown at it. Yeah, frown at it for a second. Oh, what's he talking about? Because the whole lesson, the whole plan of the lesson is right there. Okay, this one. F at prime at double 3, uh, sorry, F double prime at 3 was 12. Therefore, 3 comma, well, we'll figure that in a minute. I hope you know how to figure that out. Yeah, I hope that's not what you're worried about. We'll, we'll deal with that in a minute. Is a, and I, I can tell you, I can tell you whether it's a max or min, just from the information I have. No chart, no nothing. Bang, done. Who's got it? Has anyone got it? They know whether this is a max or min? Jamie. 
negative one is a max, and then three is a min. What is it about this derivative, double, deri double derivative, that tells you we must be talking about a max? The 12 doesn't matter, does it? Uh, the fact that it came out to the actual number 12 is not a big deal. But since it's negative, we know that the derivative must be getting more and more negative. Or less and less positive. That actually means the same thing. Double derivative negative means if you're positive, start heading towards zero. And if you're zero, start heading towards negative. Double derivative positive means the derivative is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're getting larger and larger slopes. We're getting more positive slopes is the more accurate way to say that. And so this must be a min. Handy, right? Instead of going through the chart every time, like the chart, while not difficult maybe, takes a while to set up. Imagine if there's three or four points. You've got to set up the whole chart all the way across. Here, just sub it in, sub it in, boom, boom, done. Yeah? So why didn't we do this first? Just to reiterate this thing, why not use this all the time? What's the problem with it? It can fail. If f double prime comes out to zero, you haven't learned anything, right? And then you're stuck with the first derivative test, but most of the homework, most of the questions, this works. Yeah, every once in a while it fails. Uh, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Why am I forgetting? Oh, it didn't say find the points. It said find the local maximum. But I, I think it's implied to find the point here. So negative one comma, I just su sub it into the original function there. Uh, negative one minus three is negative four plus, uh, is it five? Let me check it again. Negative one, yeah. Uh, positive one, negative four plus nine. I think it's five. Uh, I'm going to hope somebody's typing it in here. And I get negative 27 here. Is anyone, else, anyone doing the subbing there? Anyone got enough strength left to hit a couple of keys in their calculator while I sing and dance up here for you? <laughs> oh, Athena's giving me the thumbs up. You like? You like double derivative test? I, I like the second derivative test. I always use it. Uh, maybe you, you've seen me build the first derivative chart. I'm almost like, is he getting lazy? Why does he do that so fast? I'm like, because I hate it. That's why. You just found out. The first derivative test is awful. You know, it's all this work and everything. Like double derivative test. Boom. Done. Yeah? Questions here? More time? Two to go. Two to go. The right triangle represents a lot. Yeah, right. Good luck. Can you imagine somebody's backyard looking like this? Yeah. I don't know. What dimension shown? Doug wants to build. His name's Doug. I think that's so funny. He's building a fence. Yeah. Right. Doug wants to build a fence. A rectangular dog kennel. Here's the dog kennel. Do you see it in there? A little rectangle. Inside the lot was the maximum possible. I'm going to do this fairly fast because I want to stick to the skeleton. I want to make sure that all the important pieces are drawn attention to because some of this is easy. I'm just going to put a little X and a Y there. You could do base and height. You could do length and width. You can do whatever you want. I don't got, care what variables you use. And I go, okay, maximum possible area. Area equals X, Y. And what's the major flaw in this equation that we don't want to have to deal with because of the mess it makes is that it's got two variables. I've got to get rid of one of the two variables. Who was it earlier? Was it Josiah earlier who picked out? Who was it that picked out what had to happen here? Was it Brad? Oh, I forget. We can need a relationship between X and Y here. Is it screaming at you? I, I, I hope I've mentioned it enough times now, or implied it enough times, a couple of times where the multiple triangles is screaming at you here. With multiple triangles, it's almost always similar triangles. In fact, it's, it's, they're actually really nice this time. But if you're having trouble with similar triangles, take a look at this angle here. If I just put a little yellow dot on that angle and say, if I think about that angle for just a second, the tan of that angle is 4 over 12. But the tan of that angle is also in this little triangle here, those two tans have to be the same. That's the whole idea of similar triangles, is that if tan's really going to work, it has to be true for all the triangles. And so this big triangle up here, 4 over 12, has to be the same as this triangle, which is y over, ooh, I'll hesitate for a second and let you think out what that other side's got to be. I'll just, uh, just draw that triangle in there and let you think about it. I do want to mention that, actually, it's slope too. Slope is rise over run. 
that slope's got to be the same as this rise over run, which is y over, well, it's not x. It's not 12. 12 minus x. See, this popped up again. You, gotta, you almost feel that coming in the assignment. At some point, you're going to have to similar triangle and cross multiply this thing out to solve for either y or x. I don't necessarily see that one's going to be easier to solve for than the other, so I'll just do a little work and find out what's going to happen here. Uh, I get 48 minus 4x equals 12y. I like the x a little bit better. Negative 4x equals 12y minus 48. I'm going to divide by that negative 4, and I get 12 minus 3y. I've reversed the order of the two terms there because I like having the positive term first. But you don't need to do any of that stuff. That's just me being sort of playful with the numbers, I guess. Let me double check all that because I'm getting a little foggy here. 48 minus 4x is 12y. Solving for x, 4x equals to 48 minus 12y. Then divide by 4, 12 minus 3. Yeah, I like it. And I'm going to draw this on here, and I encourage you to draw it on there when you're going back to these questions. The whole point of that move was to put it in there for x. I'm seeing frowning. Who's got questions? You might have different steps here. If you don't like my steps, do your own steps and make sure you get x equals 12 minus 3y. So I get a equals 12 minus 3y times y. Do that expansion. Do that derivative. Okay, so that all I could have taught this morning. Yeah? In fact, that would have been an easier example than some of the stuff this morning. And what were the two things we had to do at the end? We had to do the first derivative test to make sure that this is a maximum. Now I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go a double prime equals negative 6. And I encourage questions here if I'm, if I'm going too fast. I, I really want to know. Therefore, y equals 2 is a... Hey, if you've gone sleepy on me, this is the moment. This is the one part you can understand to be able to get this lesson. Negative double derivative means y equals 2 is a max. Because the derivative is going to be reducing the whole time. But check out this question. It says, find the area. What is the max? It doesn't ask for the dimensions this time. This is what I was saying this afternoon. When it's all done, then you take a long pause and stare at the question and go, what did the question ask? Answer the question. The question was, what is the maximum possible area? Therefore, max area is a equals 12y minus 3y squared. I don't think it's great form to find the area in your final statement. I only do that as a teaching method here. It's like, I'm going to make this final statement. I need the area. I've got the y. Sub in the y. I get 12 meters squared. I did that really fast. So let me just make sure I haven't made a mistake. 12y minus 3y squared is the area. I know y equals 2 is the proper y value. Put it in. 24 minus 12. 12. Yeah, okay. Tell me, though. Tell me. Where, 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 where? What do you want to talk about more? I'm looking for the frowns. They're like, I don't even have enough energy left to frown. I'd love to frown, but there's nothing left. Maria, thank you. Go. It's one of the dimensions, but it's not what the question asked me. I never had to go back and find the dimensions because the dimension said, what is the maximum area? If you went through and found the dimensions, then found the area. That's not wrong to do, but here I didn't really have to because to answer the question, all I needed was the max area. So I took the y equals 2 and went back to the area equation and found the max area without ever having to find out the length of the thing. Other question might ask you for the length, and then you go back to your x equation, which is over here. Okay. Just trying to pound away at this idea that we better answer the question when we're done. More questions. That was a good one. Another good, good question. More time? Who needs more time? Can you use more time?
love technology. It's in here in my watch. Just let me know my treat is ready. I told you I got a treat for myself. You deserve one too. Mine's probably better than yours though. <laughs> we need some more time here. Athena, are we okay? That's good. <laughs> Getting a little distracted here like the day. All right, here it is. I love this question because it looks so ridiculously hard and there's this easy move. So stick with me for a dramatic move in the middle of this. A cylinder is inscribed inside a sphere with radius 10. Okay, the sphere has radius 10. Sometimes that question isn't phrased very well and it makes you wonder what has radius 10. So uh, on a test or something like that or on your assignment, you could ask me which thing is radius 10. I don't want it to be a mystery where the dimensions go. I'm not trying to you know, fool you with that. So if there's any questions about that, you let me know. What are the dimensions of the cylinder if its volume is to be maximized? Okay, so here we go. Volume of a cylinder. Uh, okay, well, I, I, I'll give you the formula for volume of a cylinder on a test. I, I, I will. At the same time, the volume of cylinder is not that complicated. Cylinders are um, just a rolled up piece of paper, right? Circle times the height. That's, that's all we're talking about. That, that's the whole formula for volume of a cylinder. So some shapes are complicated and some really aren't. Pi r squared height. Here we go again one more time. What's the difficulty with this particular equation? Two variables. We don't like two variables. We don't want to differentiate two variables so we don't have to. We don't have to here. We've got to find a relationship between the radius of this thing and the height. Okay. Get ready. Get ready. Here's the, uh, here's the moment. Up here is the radius of the cylinder. Then, through there, can I hit straight line? See, Selena, did, did, I, did I hit straight line there or no? This thing's, oh. There's height of the cylinder. Height of the cylinder, right there. And the only other piece of information I have is the radius of the sphere is 10. Now take a look at this. Only with the active board is it easy to teach this. See? I don't want that color. We need a better color, a good color. Red. I don't even know if it's going to look red at your desk. See, there's the radius of the sphere. Completely unhelpful, it seems. Yeah? If you put the radius of the sphere here, it doesn't help you at all. Yeah, it's right. That's, that's the radius of the sphere. You put the radius of the sphere here, uh, it almost sort of helps. It's kind of along the height of the cylinder, but it's not too good. Can anyone see a great, unbelievably awesome place to put the radius of the sphere that all of a sudden stuff starts to happen? Dun, 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 dun. What's that? I'm thinking of the Madagascar song, what's it? That, that uh, Afro Circus. That. Emmett's got it. Simon's got it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Lex is like, all right, I'll give you that one. I'm not laughing at much. That, that was pretty good. Where is it going to go that gives me something to work with? Gives me a chance. All right, there, and life just gets good all of a sudden. It's an unbelievably brilliant, difficult, heartbreaking, scary move because on a quiz or a, te or a test or a sign, you're like, what is going on here? But you put it there and all of a sudden life comes together. Check this out. It's a right angle triangle. I want to keep this example and show it to the grade nine sec next week because they're learning about Pythagorean theorem and wondering why are we doing this? Yeah, amid all this, Pythagorean theorem bail bails us out. Uh, this is 10. This is height of the cylinder over two, which isn't great because it's over two. That's sort of pain, but at least it's, I now have a relationship between height of the cylinder, radius of the cylinder, and the number 10. Hmm, I don't have enough space here. Hmm. I'll work down here, okay, and then I'll come back up there and we'll hope we have enough room. Okay, uh, uh, radius of cylinder squared plus height of cylinder over 2 squared equals 100. And this is a real nightmare. 
because it's r squared and h squared. So either way, square roots appear in, seemingly. My job is to solve for one of those two variables in the equation. So my job is to solve for either h, you see, because I want to sub in for h. Stick with me. Keep your brain on for another three minutes. My job is to either solve for h in this equation, so I can replace the h, or to solve for r squared. Isn't that a clever move? Really, all I'm trying to do is get rid of one of these things. So this particular equation, which is a big nasty nightmare, I could just solve it for r squared instead. Now, if you don't, if you solve for r, you'll get a square root. You put it in here, you'll immediately square it. You'll get the same thing anyways, but isn't that cool? You know? And it happens often in these equations. Of course it does, because this has squared in it, that has squared in it. You know, it's, of course the squared is going to appear twice, sometimes. A couple people grinning there. I can see the grin through their mouth. Like, if he falls, this will be the greatest lesson ever. <laughs> and a perfect reason why you don't have coke for breakfast, right? And right there, it's like, see, that's why you don't do that. Two o'clock, he's falling off chairs. All right. Look at this. Radius of cylinder squared equals 100 minus h cylinder squared over 4. I hope you're not upset what I just did there. I did two things at once. I moved this thing over, but I also squared the whole thing while I was at it. Look at that. You know, everything was so complicated. And then it came out sort of nice. Volume of cylinder, trying to buy some space here, equals pi times r squared. I'm not solving for r. You could do it. You could put a square root over there, put it in there, then square it. You, you, works. But I'm just trying to give you a few little shortcuts here. Um, 100 minus h cylinder squared over 4 all times h. Let's just make sure I did that right. I'll just keep going now. You can let me know about questions because the rest of this is pretty, pretty nice. 100 pi h minus pi over 4 h cylinder cubed, I think. How do I do? I'm multiplying everything inside by pi and by h. 100 pi h, yes. It's good. In the middle of this, once it's all cylinders, you're not worried about the sphere anymore, awfully tempting to drop the little CYL notations there. So V prime equals 100 pi minus 3 pi over 4 H squared. I saw discussions. Is everything all right? Just you know, straight questions? Maria, question? There was a squared there, and I multiplied by this h out here. So I multiplied everything inside by both the pi and the h, all at the same time. So 100 was by pi h, and then h cylinder was by the h, so I got cubed, and then a pi over 4 and an h. I, is it good? Fiona? There are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what's changing. There are many choices. I drew one cylinder. But I could have drawn this cylinder. I could have drawn this cylinder. So what's changing is the radius and the height all at once to go. There's all these different radius and heights I could choose from. Which one of those cylinders produces a maximum volume? So I could have drawn a cylinder that was, imagine like a sardine can one across here. Imagine like a thin straw one. And somewhere in the middle is this one. So what's changing? The radius and the height, they're all changing at once and are trying to find out which one will give me the best volume. Why it has to be inscribed in here is that there has to be some limits on this thing, or I could just make it. And so that, that's what puts the endpoints on this thing, some built-in endpoints on this whole thing. Great question. Uh, 0 equals 100 pi minus 3 pi over 4 h squared 
do some other algebraic steps here, see what you think of them. And I'll double check them to make sure I'm not losing it here. I do those steps fairly fast, and, and I, I'm hoping those are the kind of steps that you, you can work your way through. So here's what I did is I took the double derivative. God, it's always negative, which means that this is a max, not a ma'am, <laughs> a max. And then I sub the 11.5 back into this thing to find the radius that went with it. I, I can hear the tone of voice. My tone of voice is like, oh, that's so easy. No, I'm not saying it's that's easy, but that's the kind of stuff that's like, okay, I, yeah, I can... I can work my way through that, but you know, the other mess is what I got to talk about. Look how lucky you are that this is going to be an assignment, not a test, though, right? These are good assignment questions, like what is going on here? But, but you know, like it, it actually works out very well for all of us that you're not having to hammer these through in a in a test format. Yeah. Exam though, yeah. Use the exam next uh, Friday. Okay, what questions though? Tell me, tell me, tell me. 